All right. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. Let's get this rolling. Um, yeah, this work that I'm going to present is uh, joint uh, work together with my colleagues from the Max Planck Institute and the Ruhr University, both, uh, both being in Bochum, Germany. And it's going to be about the uh, IEEE standard uh, 1735 for hardware IP protection. So just to give you some background, I guess most of you will already know, um, but uh, modern chips are like increasingly realized as system, so-called system on chips. That means that you have such a SOC uh, that consists of uh, dozens or even hundreds of different functional modules, and those functional modules are indeed called IP cores. Um, you can see an example on the right side, like a, like a sketched example um, with a CPU, some crypto accelerator, ma a machine learning accelerator, so different functional components on one chip. Um, and due to the increasing complexity and the time to market pressure, um, we uh, like design houses, hardware design houses are required to often resort to uh, well-proven third-party IP supplied by some other IP, IP author, IP vendor. All right, and of course, if you use third-party IP, there is some security challenges that arise with that. Um, the first one, of course, being that the IP author, so the guy who made the IP actually, uh, wants to prevent infringement of the IP or even its licenses. Uh, second being that the user, so the person who um, takes the IP and incorporates it into their design, um, needs some kind of assurances on the absence of hardware trojans or manipulations. Um, and of course, uh, the tools that operate with the IP, that work on the IP, um, at the IP user's workstation, for example, um, you, you take like the IP core and you need to be able to integrate it into your design, so the tools need to be able to work with the, with the IP that you get out of the box, um, operate on the plain text for, for example, for synthesis, implementation, uh, simulation, whatever. And this is the exact reason why IEEE 1735 was established. Um, and some words on the standard, it's an, kind of an industry-wide uh, industry standard, uh, and it introduces a common format for ASIC and FPGA, FPGA IP um, to ensure interoperability between different design tools. Um, it's some kind of a transport encryption. So the um, IP is encrypted by the IP author, so the, uh, the guy that, that created the IP, and is then sent over to the user of the IP, uh, who then loads it into the, uh, into the design tool, and the design tool moves on to decrypt the IP um, within memory. And, as I said, it's industry-wide, so it's implemented by all major uh, tool providers, for example, Synopsys, Cadence, Siemens, Intel, Xilinx, and many more. Um, and our contributions in our paper are threefold. The first one, or at first, we discuss the insecurity of IEEE 1735, which I'll do in a second. Uh, then we present six case studies on implementations from Intel, Xilinx, Cadence, Siemens, Lettuce, and Microchip. Um, that all lead to a full break of the confidentiality and integrity of the protected IP. And um, in the process of doing like the case studies, we stumbled upon three white box, RSA white box schemes. And if you don't know what an RSA white box is yet, uh, you'll find out in like five to 10 minutes. Um, but we successfully attacked those white boxes and were able to like break them. All right, some words on the encryption and decryption of IEEE 1735. Um, the encryption, as I said, is performed by the IP vendor, by the author of the IP core. Um, so we have the vendor. Um, the vendor creates some, some IP core and uh, generates an AES session key. And then the IP core and the session key are used to um, encrypt the, uh, the IP core using AES. At the same time, the tool vendor, so the guy or the, the company that supplied the design tool, publishes one or more pr uh, public keys, RSA public keys actually, and these public keys are then used to encrypt the uh, session key, and both the encrypted session key and the encrypted IP core are combined into something that the standard refers to as an envelope. Um, on the decryption side, so within the IP user's um, design tool, so on the workstation of the IP user, this envelope is again split into the encrypted IP core and the encrypted session key. Um, then there is an RSA private key that is embedded into the design tool, and this is loaded uh, from the design tool and used to first recover the AES session key, and that AES session key is then again used to recover the plain text IP. And then you can, like the design tool, can go on to use the IP for, as I said, synthesis, implementation, all kinds of different tasks that need to be done during hardware design. 
So the problems with the standard, um, I'm having a couple of quotes here that come right from the standard document. First one being, a decryption tool shall manage its, its secrets in a private secure manner. It may harden such secrets directly into the software or use an external persistent storage scheme. Um, of course, the RSA private keys are kind of a valuable target for an attacker. If you've got those, you can decrypt any IP that has been encrypted with them. Um, and in practice, um, you have like one or only a few RSA keys per, per vendor or even per tool. So for example, if we talk about Xilinx Vivado, they have right now I think six keys within their tool, six RSA keys, but that's very limited and those are global across all tool instances. So there's no different keys between, between uh, instances of the software installed on different, different workstations. You can see the problem already, I guess. Um, not a single vendor of the ones we analyzed in our case studies uses the external storage scheme. That of, that's out of the picture. And of course, recovery of a key compromises confidentiality and integrity of the a, a protected IP entirely. Because you can decrypt, you can manipulate, re-encrypt, all that kinds of stuff. Next problem. Between two vendors and their users, an agreement for use of the tool should forbid tempering and reverse engineering without being granted explicit permission. Recall that this, like the tool, design tools, I run on the untrusted, in an untrusted execution environment, hence on the IP users' workstations. And how IEEE 1735 tackles this is just by forbidding reverse engineering. And of course, like if you have an elaborate, uh, malicious, an, an elaborate attacker with malicious intent, he's probably not going to be stopped by a legal agreement. Um, and third, last but not least, if a disclosure happens because a tool is hacked, that is an implement implementation issue. Each tool vendor needs to decide what, if any, uh, software protection technologies they will use here. So what they basically do is dis uh, to uh, re disregard the disclosure of IP as an implementation issue that is out of scope of the standard. Um, they consider the protection of private keys out of scope and they explicitly do not require any protections at all. Um, but as I already said, like the RSA private keys are really the trust anchor of the standard. So what, you, or what we wanted to find out then, um, our research question was, how is this actually done in practice? And this is why we looked at six tools, uh, those you can see here, from uh, Intel over Cadence, Lattice, Siemens, Microsemi, Xilinx. Um, so a wide range of larger companies and smaller companies as well. And what we've seen is that three of those companies did not protect their keys at all. Um, those are the top three ones. And of course, if you have no protections, recovery of the key is in the range of hours, sometimes even an hour only, or less than an hour. Um, for the bottom three uh, tools we analyzed, we have some form of protection um, that's actually increasing the further down the table you go. Um, so for Siemens, we have only white box crypto, what I'm gonna talk about uh, in a second. And for the others, we also have code obfuscation and anti-debugging. And for those, uh, the time to break was actually around uh, the range of days to weeks. Um, I think the, the strongest one was Xilinx was two weeks. Um, again, we successfully extracted all keys that we could, fi could find in the tools. Um, and the problem here being that commonly hardware IP supports multiple of these tools at the same time. So for example, if I produce a key, uh, an, an IP core for Lattice Radiant, Lattice Radiant will always also use model ZIM from Siemens and that way they need to support both tools. They need to encrypt their session key for both tools. And now even if Siemens model ZIM is somewhat secure, as long as Lattice isn't secure, the IP core is, is lost anyway. So recovering a single RSA private key can already compromise vast numbers of, of IP cores. What we're gonna talk about today is just Xilinx Vivado because that was the most elaborate case study we did. Um, and I'm only giving you a high level overview if you wanna see more of the details. Uh, I would ask you to look into our paper. There's a lot more technical details. Um, although we had to uh, refrain from telling you everything. Uh, all right. How we proceeded was that we started with uh, identifying cryptographic subroutines by matching against function signatures. That means that for like open source cryptographic libraries, you can compile them and you can see how the function stops look, the first couple of bytes of the function look, and then you can match that against the software you're analyzing and find where cryptographic implementations within that software reside. Um, that way, we were able to discover the RSA decryption and dump one out of five keys that Xilinx has embedded into their software. They update their keys every one to two years, so there's a couple of new keys and old ones are getting deprecated after five to 10 years. Um, 
So they have always, or at that point they had five keys, now they have six because we got five of them. Um, and okay, we dumped the first key, but we couldn't really find the other four keys that they are using. And the one we got was actually the oldest one of them all. So what we did was backtracing the function calls uh, from the decryption routine we discovered, and then after a while, we found a uh, decryption, uh, decryption dispatcher that basically selected a decryption function depending on the key that was input to, or the key that was requested from the tool. Um, what this dispatcher sadly does is make heavy use of code obfuscation and anti-debugging, but that wasn't too much of, a, of an issue because the anti-debugging was quickly defeated using publicly available tooling. Um, and the code obfuscation was then defeated using dynamic analysis, which was possible since we defeated anti-debugging. Um, and that way, we actually discovered another cryptographic routine that is ca called for all the four other keys. The problem is that it behaves like an RSA decryption, but looks completely different. So we were unable to find the secret key within the implementation or within the memory, um, but we could observe that the routine actually outputs an AES session key. And actually the AES session key that we want because we know what IP call we put in there, we encrypted that ourselves, so uh, we know what we are looking for, but uh, we couldn't find like the RSA key. So after a while of uh, Googling, uh, we figured out that this must be some kind of a white box implementation of an RSA uh, decryption. And now we get to finally get to what white box cryptography actually is. And the idea here is to protect like a secret or a secret key by merging it right into the implementation of the cryptographic algorithm itself. So that's actually a mathematical concept. That's not just obfuscation. There's a lot of work on the symmetric side. Um, and again, you merge the key into the algorithm or the implementation of the algorithm. And then the attacker model under which this needs to be secure is that the attacker has full access to the software and its execution environment, like we had. Uh, so the attacker can perform static and dynamic software analysis. Uh, they can arbitrarily execute the white box algorithm. They can examine and uh, manipulate intermediate values at runtime. And even under such hostile uh, conditions, um, the implementation must remain secure. So, yeah. And what, what does secure mean under, like in, in this setting? And this is actually where two, the two security notions of white box cryptography come into play. The first one, that's a kind of natural one, security against key extraction. So um, if you embed or if you merge the key into the algorithm, you kind of want to prevent someone getting it out again. Um, and this is what this is about. But then, of course, the question arises, okay, if the key is within the decryption algorithm, I can just take the description algorithm and run it to decrypt. So I don't need the key at all. And this is what, uh, what is called code lifting. So um, white box, or one, one of the, or the second security notion is uh, that such white box algorithms should be secure against code lifting. You so you should not be able to take the, the uh, decryption algorithm out of the software it is embedded to. That can, for example, be done using hardware binding and stuff like that. Um, but it's a kind of a hard problem in, in reality. All right, uh, what we did for Xilinx, and again, we have a lot of details on the white box that Xilinx implemented in our paper, so if you're interested, take a look. There's a lot of math in there. Um, but for here, um, I'm just gonna say that we replicated the white box in Python, so we did basically code lifting. We performed code lifting. But when, what we also wanted to know uh, is, can we get the keys out? So we wanted to, to uh, analyze both white box properties, basically. And of course, like we, we generated an algorithmic description from the, from the uh, Python code and took that algorithmic description to go to Alexander Meyer, one of the crypto professors at our university. And like two hours after we entered his office, we left with, the, with five, five RSA keys and have actually factorized uh, 2,048 uh, 2, uh, bit keys in the process. So that was quite fast. <laughs> um, and then in the end, you can use both the decryption oracle that you got by replicating the, uh, the algorithm in Python or the extracted keys to decrypt any IP core that has been encrypted for Xilinx Vivado. Um, yeah, again, see technical pe uh, paper for technical details. So conclusions, uh, there's a couple. Um, first, as, a, as you've seen, IEEE 1735 has some structural weaknesses that completely undermine its uh, security. Um, for example, it allows for extraction of the private RSA tools, uh, keys of the uh, design tool vendors, and uh, subsequently allows for IP core decryption and manipulation. Um, uh, hence, like the IEEE 1735, the standard, 
is in dire need for a revision, and a revision is actually underway and was supposed to be published last year, but I think it was uh, pushed back due to corona. Um, and within that revision, they must also make sure to protect integrity and authenticity, because in the talks with the vendors, we've actually learned that for, for some settings, integrity and authenticity are way more important than confidentiality. Um, they must point out the significance of private key protection and, of course, have a clear discussion on confidentiality and its limitations because uh, within the setting we are operating here, we will never have complete confidentiality. Uh, that's just cryptographically impossible. Um, so what we can do is only like implement raise the bar countermeasures, um, so use software protection techniques that should also be required by the standard to increase the economic effort of an attack. And in the end, we also have public key white box cryptography. And what we've also seen in our work is that uh, like it lacks public scrutiny, so there is one or two publications on public key white box cryptography only, uh, but a lot of companies are offering different white box techniques, for example, RSA white boxes. Uh, so you should take all, the, all those implementations with a grain of salt and be careful about proprietary, such proprietary solutions and only deploy them with other software protection measures in place. And that concludes my talk. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thanks for the great talk. Hello, nice presentation. Uh, my name is Animesh, University of Florida. Uh, so in our CC17 book, we found out weaknesses in the IEEE standard and uh, Upon responsible disclosure, we got a season uh, does this notice by one of the vendors. How was your interaction with the vendors? I prefer not to comment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for, for the six vendors we have published here, uh, they, were, they were nice to us. Uh, so we had a good uh, exchange with them and a uh, productive exchange, actually. And most of them have already tackled the issues. Like, they have deployed uh, stronger uh, software protections. Uh, but yeah, on the rest, I prefer not to comment. <laughs> Hi, great talk. Jeremy Epstein, National Science Foundation. What I was curious about is, um, uh, given that in your chart, and, and, and your slides weren't numbered, so I can't tell you which uh, one, where, where you talked about uh, several of them having no protection and several of them having partial protection, um, what I was curious about is, given that it only took a few weeks, uh, is the some protection really any better than no protection, given that an adversary presumably can stand to wait a few weeks? Uh, it seems to me that there's no difference between those at the top of the chart and those at the bottom of the chart. I mean, um, at least for, for some of the unprotected ones, like even unskilled reverse engineers are able to recover the keys. So, um, so there is a difference. Um, for example, for Xilinx, I think the attack took around two weeks that we did, that we performed. Mm -hmm. uh, they have improved their, their obfuscation, and our guess is that they would now, it would now take us months, if not, if not longer, to, to actually recover the keys. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is actually, it makes a difference whether you protect your keys or not. But of course, key protection is not the only issue here, because like, even if the keys are protected, the plaintext IP might still be in memory at some point, mm -hmm. uh, and recovering plaintext IP can mm -hmm. be done all over the software because it's mm -hmm. used all over the design tool yeah. and you cannot really protect everything. Thank you. All right, let's uh, thanks the speaker again. Thanks.